Guthrie Govan is one of the greatest guitarists of our time. He started playing the guitar at age three and played his first gig by five. Since then, he's become a legendary figure in the modern music scene, blending a wide range of genres in his music and improvising lines better than most can compose. In this video, you'll learn the eight concepts that Guthrie used to achieve mastery and how to apply them to your own practice and playing. Number one, always have a goal in mind. An important step in the journey of playing guitar is figuring out what you want out of the instrument and the kind of player you want to be. You have to figure out specific goals. You have to ask yourself, why am I playing this instrument? What do I expect the instrument to give back to me? And how do I intend to apply all the stuff that I'm working on right now? Think about the aspects of playing that will better allow you to convey your musical voice. Once you've figured out what those things are for you, always set goals and be sure to work towards them. Number two, transcribe a lot. One of Guthrie's most impressive skills is his ability to sound good in any genre. This comes from the fact that he's listened to and transcribed from a lot of different music. All I've ever done over the years I've been playing guitar is just listen to everything around me and absorb the aspects of it that I liked. I think when I'm playing something, I guess subconsciously I'm drawing on this big library of things that I've heard before and liked enough to want to work out. If you want to improve your ear training, sense of melody and your ability to improvise while also creating a unique voice on the instrument, transcribing from a wide range of music is one of the best ways to go. There's a time and a place for tabs, tutorials and sheet music, but don't neglect transcribing. Number three, learning music as a language. If you want to improvise, I think your goal ultimately is to make music feel like your first language. And the way to do that is to try and learn music in the same way that you learned your first language. When you first started to speak, I doubt you put a lot of time into learning every single noun or every single verb before you started to talk. You likely, through a process of trial and error, heard what other people were saying and developed your own style of speaking that was influenced by those that you listened to. Number four, making the most out of scales. Something that Guthrie emphasizes a lot in his lessons is not just to learn the notes of the scale, but learn how they feel in the context of the music. If you take the time to internalize how these notes feel for you in the context of the music, you'll be working with the scale rather than being controlled by it. The thing that you want to disappear or to phase out slowly is that decision. It's like, okay, so apparently we're in A minor. So if I use this shape, apparently this is a bunch of all the notes that don't sound wrong. <laughs> so I'll just kind of just use all of those notes. And yeah, you can play a bunch of notes that don't sound wrong, but it never really feels like you chose those notes. You're just trusting the, like the safety net of a scale shape. I think it's good to go through that, but then eliminate it. Gonna kind of go beyond the scale shape. This also allows you to use tension and release in your phrasing with a lot more intention. You'll know which notes feel more safe and which ones don't, and you'll be able to tell a story with the music more effectively. Because if you ended every phrase with just the root note, it'd begin to sound pretty bland pretty quickly. I would argue that if I tease you with a note like the fourth for a while and then give you the root note, you appreciate the root note more mm -hmm. than if I just played root notes. So tension and release is an important thing. So even if a note in a scale sounds a bit weird, that doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. That just means listen to your inner music critic. You know, try and feel along with whatever you're playing. When whatever phrase you're playing, you know, ask yourself, do I want this to remain tense and weird? Do I want to tease people a little longer? Or have they suffered enough? Shall I give them a nice note? <laughs> but all of this stuff is really obvious to you if you just listen to each note in the scale over the appropriate chord. But it's not obvious to you if you just learn a bunch of shapes and think, well, these are all the right notes. If I just use these notes, then no one will ever hear me make a mistake. I don't like this binary idea that there are right notes and wrong notes, ones and zeros, because I think there's a whole spectrum of rightness and wrongness. And that's the fun. That's how you keep listeners interested. Number five, there's a time and a place for music theory. Guthrie's philosophy on music theory is one that puts musicality above all else. It's great to have technique, it's great to know about theory, but ultimately your goal is to absorb all of that so it can just be running in the background. Become second nature. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff a computer does that you don't see on the desktop because it would yeah. just be distracting. Yeah. It's happening secretly. And that's where theory should end up. Yeah. Sort of buried somewhere deep within you and you can access it when you need it but you're not consciously thinking about it. There's a place for music theory. There are certain problems it can solve and certain problems it was never designed to solve. Number six, something to keep in mind when you're playing fast. Something Guthrie's pointed out in a lot of his lessons is that there's no point playing really fast if there's no actual substance behind the music. If you can't play one note so yeah. that it, it means something, if you can't invest some of your identity and some of what you're feeling into the notes you're playing, then yeah. why are you playing? There will never be another Sean. But if 
if there's one thing we can all learn from him, it is if you must play fast, play good stuff fast. There's a time and a place for going 100 k's per hour. Just remember, no matter how fast or slow, how hard or soft that you're actually playing, try and play with as much conviction as possible. Music There's always a, a kind of zen aspect, whatever you're playing, however monotonous or simplistic it might seem, there's still a challenge, it's like how perfectly can I play this? Number seven, create musical headroom. It's not possible to know too much, it's not possible to have too much technique. I'm a big believer that in the idea of headroom. I think it's great for any musician, whatever stuff they want to do. I think it's really good if their ability is slightly in excess of anything that they plan to do. It feels nice to know that you have an extra gear and that you probably will never need to use it. Number eight, the success equation. Realize that Guthrie only differs from you and I in two different ways. Number one, the amount of time that he's put into the instrument and number two, the goals or the intentions he had when he was putting that time in. Realised that Guthrie was a beginner at some point too, that he only knew the five chords that his dad taught him. This happened to be at the age of three, so he has a pretty distinct advantage on the time side of the scale, but that shouldn't demotivate you. This leaves us with an obvious formula for success. The amount of time that you put into your instrument, plus the goals that you set and achieve within that time, are directly proportional to the amount of improvement that you see. After all, 20 minutes of intentional practice each day gets you a lot further than two hours of mindless noodling. And here's something to remember when you're putting that practice in. It's a work in progress. Um, but of course it never ends.